When my husband and I moved to Texas, we moved to the suburbs and everything was new and everything was different, but I, we started having kids. And as soon as they can walk, right, you start thinking, do they look like a baseball player? Do they look like a basketball? What are we gonna put them in first? And in Texas, they do a lot of soccer and I'm not familiar and football makes me nervous because my kids are little. And so we tried, we baited them with T-ball, and we baited them with YMCA soccer and it didn't stick. And I had this dream, I had this plan that I was gonna be this awesome, fun mom that brought the best snacks to the dugout and who yelled at the umpires and the refs because that was my childhood. And we just wanna recreate our lives through our kids sometimes. And I thought this is gonna happen and year after year it went by and my plan was slowly dying. <laughs> And I realized I will be sitting uh, politely in front of an orchestra. I have a son that plays viola. They don't let you yell at those things. <laughs> and recreational gymnastics and theater. And they get real upset if you clap at the wrong time. <clears throat> and so after 17 years of being in Texas, one of my brothers calls and says, hey, I just want you to know we're leaving California. We're coming to Texas. And he has three sons who are giant and built like athletes. They play everything. And when he moves, he doesn't think about like car insurance or home. He said, here's priority one, get Owen on an AU team. And I said, all right, I'm on it. So excited. They moved an hour and a half from our home in the first Saturday of his first tournament. They said, I know it's traffic. I know it's a drive. I was like, 90 minutes is nothing. Like I got my coffee, my Nikes, my sweats. I'm ready to yell. So excited, walked into that gym and I could hear, if you've been into a basketball gym, you can hear the whistles and the squeaking of the stinkers. And I was like, oh, this is happening. May not have happened through my kids, but I'm gonna be this fun aunt. I'm gonna yell and I sat about four feet from a mom of a player on the other team, which in hindsight may have not been the best decision. <laughs> and it's two minutes into the game, my nephew gets punched in the face. And <laughs> they, these are 13 year old boys. I don't know if you, have any of you been to an AAU game? I mean, it's intense and these people act like they're scouts here, their NBA careers are on the line. And so I'm getting worked up. I can feel my chest tightening. I mean, I am, I'm starting to see red, and at some point I may have yelled very casually to the mom whose son did hit my nephew, you cannot punch people in the face. And then her son gets hurt, pummeled on a layup, and then pandemonium breaks out. And it's an all out bra, and parents are yelling. And I cannot even think my, if you've ever been really angry where the, you can feel the blood pumping in your temples, and before I know it, I watch a grown woman punch a 13-year-old boy. And I thought, what is happening? <laughs> and suddenly, whistles blow, refs have to get control. We, it's like, hide your kids, hide your wives. We, we <laughs> huddle to the side. And they get control, they come back, they ask this mom and her family to leave. And they can't, and they said, your son's team will never be invited back to the tournament. They finish the game. Her son, who's clearly an incredible athlete, they win. But that day, she lost. So I want to I wanna jump in today, and, and if you have a Bible with you, awesome. You want to take some notes, awesome. I'm a professor, so that's just what I say all the time, like, get out your pen. You're going to want to write this down. And if you are at home on... Um, if you're at home, you want to text connect, can you put this, the number on the screen? And if you're saying, listen, I, this resonates with me and I want to talk to somebody about this, or I just want to be a part of what's happening at the village, you can text connect to 815-792-9006. So if you're online, jump in with us. If you're here, grab a Bible, a note, use your phone. We'll assume the best of you. Um, but we want to talk today about... Uh, about this idea of being angry or mad. Last week, Nick talked about being sad. Uh, we wanna look at being mad. We have this mixed, uh, mixed feelings about anger, the emotion of anger. I don't know if you've ever watched an angry woman clean a kitchen, but it's impressive. Um, <laughs> and, and anger can fuel some really great things. A lot of people can get pretty worked up about things that matter and they can accomplish a whole lot. But just like fuel, if it's not harnessed, 
can destroy a lot of things. And one of the things I, I want you to really take away from today is we can still be wrong even when we're right. That mom at that AA tournament absolutely should have gotten upset that the ref didn't call, that her kid could have gotten really hurt. But in her being right, she missed out. And one of the things that anger has the ability to do is to isolate us. Uh, I, <laughs> last week, Nick talked about how sometimes we, emotions or being emotional is not necessarily synonymous with being masculine. And so he mentioned a few masculine characters, like Indiana Jones, and he talked about MacGyver. I brought, a, I brought some Texas flair to that lineup. Um, if, <laughs> and this is John Wayne. Uh, this, is ev- this is everybody's hero in the state of Texas. If you were a kid, you looked up to John Wayne, steady Eddie, just rode his horse, made things happen. My favorite John Wayne movie as a kid was McClintock. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's this classic funny movie about a marriage that is destroyed. <laughs> it's really what it's about. And they get reunited, and he's married to this fire engine woman who gets angry in lots of sort of ways. And there's this key moment in the movie where he says... <laughs> Isn't it about time that you told me what put the burr under your saddle? And I thought, isn't that so true? We are not really good at saying what's wrong or what we're feeling. It comes out in a lot of ways, but we don't sit down and go, ah, I'm so upset. Here's what I know to be true. Even though our experiences are unique, we've all been wronged at some point, and some of us really badly. But the truth is, our emotions are universal. To our brains and to our bodies, it doesn't feel any different. I learned in that gym three months ago that my heart rate can jump 70 beats a minute when I'm angry. (laughs) My watch told me that. I lived with a headache the rest of the day. Our emotions have the ability to affect our physiology and anger is actually one of the most damaging to our blood pressure Right? It can cause all kinds of health issues, but it can also cause a lot of heart issues. And it can destroy relationships and careers, and it can disconnect us from the people that matter most. So I want to jump in, and I want you to see uh, if you can sort of identify yourself. Uh, we know that all of us experience emotion, even those of us that say I'm not an emotional person, anger's probably your go-to. I call it the lazy man's emotion, right? So you're not crying, but you are letting people know that you're angry. You're, what your brain calls the amygdala gets heightened. And one of the things a lot of people, Rochelle and I geek out on brain science a little bit, but that we don't make good decisions when our amygdala is heightened. I know you're shocked to know that but you've probably made a poor decision when you were really upset. So we're gonna look at ways this manifests because I think sometimes people that are, are, we call like um, ready to go off at any moment, we use terms like, you know, that's just a bomb waiting to explode. Those kinds of, those people get a bad rap, but we all, we all kind of display our anger in different ways. So we're gonna look at four different sort of pictures and I want you to see, and if you're taking notes, you just write down, don't wait for the person to elbow you and say that's you. You just write it down and go, hey, that's me. Okay, let's look at the first one. We have the, the trash compactor, you're the stuffer. You just stuff and you stuff and you stuff. Sometimes we describe people like this as doormats and you don't see their anger. It just goes in and in and in. And I don't know if you've been around a stuffer that's had to to push things down for a really long time, but it's not unlike a trash can where you keep shoving it and shoving it and shoving it. It starts to smell. Sometimes it overflows. There's a reason in my family that we still talk about the Thanksgiving of 1996. (laughs) because my mom is a stuffer. (laughs) And that was the day we figured out that she'd been stuffing for quite some time. (laughs) So maybe you're the person that pushes it down and, and what happens is really sad and we don't see your explosions usually, but on the inside of you, you're shutting down and you're isolating yourself. We use language like that person's dead inside 
And eventually that anger sort of just decomposed into com being completely sort of oblivious and numb to the rest of the world. I want to look at the second one. Uh, this one is sort of the classic volcano. So just close your, close your eyes and imagine the last time you saw someone erupt, right? This is um, my dad trying to fix a sink, right? These, when people say, we walk on eggshells around them, you're a volcano. <laughs> if, you, if you've ever said like, oh, we don't know how this is gonna go. <laughs> We're gonna give this person bad news and they may erupt. So everybody just stand back, right? You know those people. Maybe they throw things, maybe there's a dent in a wall in your garage and that was your volcano moment. <laughs> we have, a, we have this, this simmering boil all the time that they're just right at the surface. And sometimes that's part of a personality. I have a 10 year old that is this big and she sounds like Minnie Mouse. And every so often, the kids in the cul-de-sac will come in and go, Lucy, shove somebody down today. <laughs> and I said, can we talk about this? And she said, do you ever feel like you're just almost going to hurt someone all the time? <laughs> and I said, whoo, we need to work on this, right? But I have a volcano. Okay, the third one. So maybe you're not a trash compactor. Maybe you're not a volcano. This is my personal favorite. Maybe you, maybe you stay pretty steady and you think you're an intelligent person and you're a prosecuting attorney. You're always building a case for why you're right. You're always building a case. You're presenting evidence all the time. You, you're pretty upset about something, but you're gonna systematically get everybody to that place <laughs> where they were wrong and you were right. But what happens in that process is that you're building evidence and you're actually just building a wall because nobody can get to you or connect with you. And there's no relationship there because you're still just trying to build your case and convince everybody that you're right. Okay, let's talk about the last one. Um, this is the stealth bomber. The clinical like textbook term for this is passive aggressive, okay? So if you're the person that takes anger, then you get pretty calculated and then you sneak it in, right? You just drop these little, we call them um, tearing people apart with your rhetoric, but like you're just dropping side comments that let people know you're not okay, like you're pretty upset, but you're not gonna let them see it, right? You're just gonna slide it in. You let it lay under the radar, lay under the radar, and then it, you know those people at the last minute, they just sort of attack. I want to look at, um, we've looked at how we handle in our, in our own ability, in our own like sort of growing up co coping mechanism that no one has to teach us. No one has to teach us to lose our cool. No one has to teach us to say, here's how I'm right and you're wrong. That's what we naturally would do. But one of the things that I, that I want to share with you this morning is I want to take a minute and look at scripture. As a little girl, it's true, we memorized a lot of scripture, but you should know I got bribed to do that my whole life. We were never given an allowance. They just paid us to memorize scripture, <laughs> and it stuck. I do know that the Bible is this anchor. It's this roadmap. It's a different way, and it may not make sense to the world because we just dance with the dysfunction. We just say, your dad's a volcano, and we'll live with it. We just say, that's just how she defends herself and we live with it, but we don't live connected lives to people. And we don't live connected lives to our creator or our purpose. So I wanna take a minute and, and I tell my students often, here's my goal, I wanna shift the way that you view it so that it will change the way you do it. Does that make sense? So we're gonna shift how we look at it. So let's go to the first scripture. What does the Bible say about sin? It says um, in Ephesians 4, 26, 27, in your anger, do not sin. Notice it's not an if, but when you get angry. It's not a sin to be angry. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Let's go to the next one. There are two key words in these scriptures that echo each other. Hebrews says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it become defiled. Foothold, root. You ever felt like anger got you? It just took you and couldn't, and couldn't let it go? You let it stay too long, and now it's hurting the people around you? and it's hurting you. 
I want to look at a guy in the Old Testament who lived up close to Jesus, got to see all the miracles, all the cool things, and he had a moment where he lost it. I hope this gives you hope (laughs) that you could be the most spiritual person in the room and we're still going to blow it sometimes. Let's look at this this story in the book of John um, about this guy named Peter. And this is a moment in history where Jesus is about to be crucified. His best friend is about to be killed. But in the moment, Peter is not liking what is happening. And research says we get angry when things don't go the way we want, right? That's not rocket science. (laughs) And things are not going the way Peter wants them to go. And so in the scripture, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen, he knew to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Go to the the next one. And again, he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you, I'm he. In a posture of humility, posture of surrender, if you're looking for me, then let these men go. And look what happens. Um, And Peter is standing there with him. And then this happens so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I've not lost one of those you've given me. Then Simon Peter, who's standing next to him, who considers himself one of Jesus' best friends, is upset that they're arresting him and that this isn't supposed to happen. And he draws his sword and he strikes the high priest, cutting off his right ear. Now, you may have cut somebody off in traffic today, but you did not cut their ear off. (laughs) I love they tell this story in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and John is the only one that says Peter did it. The others just say one of the disciples. (laughs) They're real political, (laughs) but John was like, no, it's Peter. I think they had a little bit of a competition today. And Jesus commanded him and said, Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? He said, this is the plan. It's not going the way you want it to go, but you don't need to jump in and hurt somebody in the process because it's not happening the way you wanted it to to happen. So we may have spent our lives being trash compactors, volcanoes, right? Prosecuting attorneys, stealth bombers. But I want to look at what do we do with anger in a new way? How can we look at it differently so it doesn't disconnect us from the people that matter most? So we're going to look at three ways. So if you're you're taking notes, write these down. We're going to look at three things we can do in this process of anger. We're going to go through them kind of quickly. Number one, find the root. I have this picture that you can, um, on this next slide, uh, I study communication and I teach a lot about conflict and about anger. And one of the things that's really interesting about anger is research says when conflict happens, 80% of the time it has nothing to do with what's happening in the moment. Right? So I had, I had some cousins who had a falling out. When I asked what happened, one threw a fit, moved out, and they said he ate his grapes. And I said, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's probably not about the grapes, (laughs) right? 80% of the time, what you see in someone's anger or lashing out has nothing to do with what is happening in the moment. So we have to kind of unpack that. I want you to think about anger like a check engine light. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but some of us drive around with the check engine light on for a long time before we open the hood. And it's costly. So it's this... We, it's easy to get angry. It's hard to say I'm scared. I'm hurt. I don't want this to happen. I spent some time with the story of Peter, and if you go back the night before, and I think I put the scripture on the screen, you, you, or the verse on the screen, you see that Jesus told them just the night before, hey, I came, into, I came from the Father, entered the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. And when I read this, I had this flashback to when my mom used to come when I had babies. And she would stay with me to help me because I had no idea what I was doing. And she would would do laundry and she would do dishes. And I had this newborn baby and no no one had taught me how to do that. And every time she would get ready to leave, I would pick a fight. I'd get really irritable. And my husband would be like, what is going on? And I learned by the third kid that I didn't want her to leave. (laughs) I would start to get literally this anxious feeling of like, I don't think I can do this. I would bet you that Peter was dealing with more than just anger. He was scared. Jesus was about to go. And they were going to ask these 12 men to turn the world upside down for the sake of the gospel. And he was like, I don't think we can do it. 
So maybe you just stay, <laughs> right? When we feel inadequate, it's easier to get angry. We have to stop and reflect, find the root. Second one, we're gonna go through these quickly um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up today. Um, we have to go make it right. I was listening to the guys in the back talk today about social media and they're like, nobody talks to anybody anymore. When we're upset about something, you see this word go throughout scripture because it's not natural and it's not what we want to do. So Jesus says, you have to go now. <laughs> You have to do something. You gotta go to that person. Not post on social media. Don't you hate it when they know who you're talking about? <laughs> it's not a secret. And people will jump in and fuel your anger and be like, you're right, that's terrible, they're awful, you are right. It leads to some pretty ugly things and it leads to isolation. We can't wait for that anger to take root. We gotta go make it right. Say, I'm sorry. Even if they wronged you, to go and say, hey, what can I do? Can we talk about this? It's really easy to get angry and hate people when you're distant from them and, you only, and you're only communicating through maybe social media. It's hard to hate people up close. Okay, third one, and this is uh, probably for sure the most important. Um, scripture says, Christ has forgiven you. Let's read this, uh, this scripture really quick just so we know. You can write this down, go back to it later. Matthew 5, 23 says, if you're offering your gift at the altar, coming into church even maybe, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and then go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. We go through life holding on to things and we need to stop and say, hey, I need to make this right. Okay, let's go to the, the third one, the last one. We need to remember Christ has forgiven us. In our needing to be right and, and making everything around us wrong, we have to remember that, that we've messed up. Let's read the scripture together about forgiveness. It's so powerful. Ephesians 4.31 says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with any form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. We can't give away to people what we don't have or have not received. If you haven't experienced the forgiveness of God, it's really hard to forgive other people. And if you're a Christ follower, we're commanded to forgive. But if you're checking this thing out for the first time or your, your neighbor drug you here, I want you to know you don't have to live angry. You can accept the forgiveness of God. None of us are good. None of us were born just being naturally forgiving. I live about 20 minutes from a little town called Pearland. And if that, that town sounds familiar, it's because last month the Pearland Little League team made it to the World Series. I was at their field last week. It's an incredible thing for 12-year-old boys. But I want you to see this picture on the screen. There was one game that determined whether they would go to the World Series. And the, the state champions from Oklahoma were playing the state champions from Texas. It was 3-2 to two early in the game. And Tulsa had two runners on, and they were getting momentum. And their star hitter steps up to the plate, Isaiah Jarvis. And the week before, all the news media had interviewed him. He said, I have a dream to go to the Little League World Series. I have a, I have a dream to be on the Sports Center top 10. And in a second, the pitcher of the Pearland team loses control and hits Isaiah in the head with a pitch. And he drops to the ground. And you can hear the crowd gasp, trainers run out, coaches are concerned. Everybody's around, nobody knows what's going to happen next. Isaiah collects himself and he walks to first base. And the camera's just on him and on his mom and trying to see who's going to lose it. And I don't know if you've watched a lot of ball games, but typically if someone hurts someone else, it ends a lot like the AAU situation, <laughs> right? In a brawl. But what happened next made the entire world take notice. Isaiah set his helmet down and he looked at the guy that hurt him and he had compassion on him. And he walks and he embraces him and he says, you're doing okay, buddy. I'm okay and it's okay. Let's go. 
Isaiah lost the game that day, but he won the hearts of the whole sports community. He made it on Sports Center top 10 that night, and the Little League World Series said, would you like to throw the first pitch at the game in Williamsport next week? His dreams came true, and it didn't happen the way he thought it would happen. They interviewed Isaiah after the game, and he said this really cool thing. He said, you know, they said, what were you thinking when you're standing there? He said, well, first my head hurt, because <laughs> that's real life. When people hurt us, it hurts, and there's no badge of honor to not admit that. And then he said, I looked at Caden, and I thought, this is an opportunity to show Jesus' love. And what would Jesus do? Those boys became friends, and it opened the door to shift an entire sports world to say, you know, if we did it differently, it would end a lot differently. I don't know what made you mad today. <laughs> and it could be anything from not finding match socks <laughs> to maybe being like me Friday when you wanted to get work done and you ended up in a cancer ER with your father-in-law. We all experience anger at some point, but we serve a God that gives us a process that says, why don't you sit with me for a minute? Let's look at, at this, let's unpack it together. If there's somebody that you need to make it right with, make it right, and maybe, you need to just sit and take a deep breath and remember that the God of the universe created you and he wants to connect with you and he doesn't want you to live angry. And he has a plan and it's probably not the way you think it's gonna go. But I'll tell you what, after about 40 years of doing this dance with him and this life with him, I've learned to trust that it's better.